Hi, I'm Spencer Har, and this is Heart to Heart. I'm so excited to introduce you to my first ever guest, a very special guest, voice actor Andrew Russell. Yeah, woohoo! The crowd goes wild. <sighs> Welcome to Heart to Heart, Andrew. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's nice to see you. Andrew is, a, is an incredible voice actor. He voices the blue hair guitar playing superhero Luca Convent on the hit TV show Miraculous Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir. Yeah, Luca's the best. He's my favorite character. Hey, there you go. You got the shirt on. Way to go. I didn't prepare. Wait, no, I do have this hat. Look at this hat. <laughs> It's a it's a miraculous ladybug culture fly hat, but I have headphones on, so I can't wear it. It'll mess up my hair. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate it, Spencer. No problemo. Hey, I'm great to have you. I'm super. Oh, speaking of, wait. First of all, um, everybody should know that Spencer has has been a really awesome person in my life uh, thus far, and made me this awesome pin. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see that. There it is. It's a little Luca pin. Wait, hold on. It'll 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 clear up there. Um, it's a little Luca pin. You see that? And I keep this pin close to my side, right over here. I have a little Luca shrine with little trinkets that people have given me over the years of my favorite things, and that's one of them. And I keep it close by. That's so awesome. Yeah, I love it. If you haven't seen the show, if you haven't seen the show yet. You, you're really missing out. It got everything. I love squares, superheroes, villains, music, a lot of an emotional highs and lows. It really got all. Can you tell a little bit about the show and character you play, that you play? I, absolutely. So Miraculous Ladybug is an amazing show that has brought so much life and joy to so many people around the world. Um, it follows the adventure of Ladybug and Cat Noir, and the character that I play, his name is Luca Coffein, and he is actually, uh, he's also holds a miraculous called Viperion. And basically what happens in the show is you see Marinette and you see uh, Cat Noir or Adrian go through all their adventures and they have a bunch of friends and sidekicks and all kinds of people. And Luca is one of those people. He's one of the close friends of both Marinette and Adrian. And I've been in the show for four years now. It's been pretty great. Wow. Then where where can people watch the show? They can watch it uh, all over the place, really. They can watch it on YouTube, on Netflix. Uh, I'm sure it's on Disney somewhere floating around. They, they can find it all over the internet. Just take a look and search around on your favorite uh, way to consume videos and media. Season four had ended. It should, with a shot of cliffhanger. Are you working on it now? Are you working work on season five? Oh, uh, I am working on season five. And it's, it's, I got to tell you, I was blown away by what they did at the end of season four. It was really, really cool. And there was a lot of like mystery and, and things happening around what happens with my character, Luca, and what he knows and what uh, other people do don't know without getting anything away. And, um, Really, I'm looking forward to seeing in season five if if we develop that at all and like what happens next because there's so much potential of what's going to happen. I, I am so excited to share with you guys. Can you give us a little teaser what what's gonna happen? Uh maybe this is for the hardcore miraculous ladybug fans. Maybe the cucumber will remake an appearance. I love the <laughs> I'm a cucumber. I'm a cucumber. <laughs> hey, you nailed that. That was a great impression. I know you're in the in a, in a game called Genshin Impact. It's a really popular video game right now. I'm playing it too. Are you working on anything else right now? That's awesome. Yes, I am. I actually have a session today and on Monday for a really popular game. I can't tell you what it is because I've signed what we call NDAs, a non-disclosure agreement where I can't really talk about it until it comes out. So this is a really exciting game um, that I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, but I will tell you, 
it's kind of like in the world of like Genshin Impact. I loved working on Genshin Impact. I actually played a bunch of characters over a variety of different sessions for that game. Um, you can find me all throughout the world. Uh, I actually got to voice um, the character. His name is Yosurf, which is uh, this little boy's lost dad. And it was really funny because um, I stream games on Twitch sometimes. And when I first started playing Genshin Impact, I found the little boy in the game. And I didn't know that I was going to play his dad. And I started going on an adventure. And in this adventure, you find these journals, right? And these journals, like, they have stories. And the dad's, like, telling, like, oh, man, I'm, I'm climbing up the mountain. And I hope that I hope that I make it okay. I love my family. Stuff like that. On my Twitch stream, I was just playing around reading the lines as if I was his dad, who at the time wasn't in the game. And then when I got cast into the game, I went into the, to the session. And the casting director and the director said, you're going to be playing Yosurf, who's the Lost Boy's dad. And I was like, did I will this into existence? What happened? It was amazing. So I had a great time doing Genshin Impact. That was a lot of fun. Do you like voice acting, voice, voicing animated shows or video games more? I, that's a tough question because I really enjoy animation for a lot of the high energy over the top, like really fun character -y sort of work. And then I love video games because they're much more um, they're much more grounded in a cinematic universe. So things like uh, Genshin or even this game that I made called Lost Ark, it's very uh, cinematic in their storytelling, although the character is still really heightened and really like over the top dramatic sometimes uh, that character still lives in a very grounded place. So approaching it from an actor's perspective, it's much more challenging and much more uh, exciting for me to play a video game character because I get to really dive into like a, the voice of a Umarian dwarf in the distant lands of Arcasia or, you know, a, you know, a goofy character, but I have to make them realistic. And that's a challenge. It's very difficult, but it's a lot of fun. How do you become a, a voice actor? Do you always want to be a voice actor? Isn't it, isn't it your dream? Of course. Yeah. I, I've always wanted to do voice work when I was in seventh grade. Actually, I started playing video games a lot and something clicked like that in my brain once I was playing a game and I heard the characters and I said, those are people getting paid to be voice actors like this is a career. And from that moment forward, I started looking at video games in the perspective of an actor's perspective. I started listening to the way that they're doing things and doing all that stuff. So all my years of doing theater and musical theater was all leading me to try to learn and hone in on my craft and get to the point where I could be a voice actor. And that's where I am now. And I love it. And I, I think anybody who wants to do it, what they have to do is just start working on things now start practicing now and there's no time like the present there's no better time to look on youtube there's all kinds of resources on tiktok and all that stuff as long as you're really hyper focusing and looking for the content that you want to be looking for you can learn how to do anything right now so i say go for it now we're gonna play a little game called this or that it helps our audience to get to know you better i shout out two things and you can pick one You'd like the best. Okay. Great. Pizza or burgers? Uh, pizza. Summer or winter? Summer. Sweet or savory? Ooh, uh, ooh, uh, sweet. Cats or dogs? Oh, dogs. 100%. High tops or low top shoes? Low tops. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> Thank you so much for being my guest today, Andrew. I think you are really awesome and super talented. And it's, it was an honor to have you on the show. Well, thank you for having me, Spencer. It's really, really the pleasure is mine. I'm so happy you asked me to be here. No problemo. I, lo um, I love you. <sighs> Mwah.
Hi, my name is Chris Tenney. I am an actor and stand-up comic. I've been in dozens of commercials, a few films, and I've performed at a few comedy clubs in Southern California. Oh, and I am also autistic. Now, I love going to professional car shows because uh, in addition to seeing all the new models before they hit the showroom floor, there's also the concept cars you don't get to see anywhere else. And those are some real nice ones. But I also like going to the, you know, the amateur ones where they bring their pristine classics or their rat rods or even sometimes their scratch-built customs. But either way, I get to see under their hoods, you know, talk to some of the owners. And, uh, you know, I'd like to take you on a little tour of some footage I shot the last time I was there. Okay, here's the first car and one of our regulars, a 1972 Datsun 240Z with a small block Chevy V8 in it. In addition to that, it's also got a little spoiler and funny little stickers like V8 inside or uh, Hybrid 240Z. Burns gasoline and rubber. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Oh, and it's also got a nice little roll cage. And here we have a uh, Corvette. Not much to say about it. This one looks pretty stuck, except for maybe the paint job. So we'll move on to the Trans Am next to it. Not much to say about that one, admittedly, but it's also got a very nice interior and is also one of our regulars. Looks to be a 79 model, I think. Yeah, definitely a 79. And, uh, let's see, looks... Kathy's... May or may not be a Dodgers fan, but, the, but either way, definitely a nice car. Possibly custom interior, too. And, of course, there's some funny little fuzzy dice there. <laughs> Can't have a classic car without fuzzy dice. <laughs> and, uh, next to that, we have a, uh, Ford Fairlane. Crown Victoria. Looks to be a resto mod, judging by the wheels and the steering wheel. So, uh, but it looks absolutely gorgeous. Good old chrome and two-tone paint. Hard to go wrong with that look. Probably a 56 mile, actually. Definitely 56. Oh! And, of course, we have one of those old Ford two-door sedans. Another resto mod by the looks of it. And, uh, there are these little side windows with some very tasteful etchings on them. Little flowers. I think those were aftermarket options in, the, in those days. Probably got them now. Still a gorgeous car, regardless. And here we have a Mitsubishi Eclipse convertible. Not much to say about that. But the MG next to it, that's a beauty. And it may or may not be imported, which is weird because of the, oh, and the National Rambler wagon. That's always nice. And, of course, there's a uh, another Crown Vic. Can't tell if it's a rat rod or if it's just a restoration in progress, though. Then we got to speak with the owner. But next to that, we have a very nice Malibu Super Sport convertible. Nice black color, white interior. Oh, cream, I think. But yeah, definitely gorgeous. Ah, and of course, there's what I tried to film on the side, so sorry about that. On to the uh, car next to it, we have a Studebaker. Probably a Hawk of some kind, but the hood is kind of throwing me off, so it might be something different entirely. Maybe a different year. I don't know. Definitely a Studebaker, though. I know the, I know that. And speaking of Studebaker, we have an Avanti next to it. Avantis were, you know, there's a whole thing about them, but this model was built on a uh, 2005 Ford Mustang chassis. And uh, fortunately, the company would go into bankruptcy a year later, just like its parent company, Studebaker. Shame, really. Beautiful cars. Oh, and here we have a 1957 Chevrolet Nomad. A, you know, a station wagon version of the venerable 1957 Bel Air sedan and coupe. And convertible. I don't think many of the Nomads were made in comparison to Bel Air. Can't remember? Eh, I'll have to look it up later. 
But uh, either way, it looks mostly stock, save for the wheels and steering wheel. I think the engine might be stock too, but heavily modded. Oh, look, there's an aftermarket tachometer. Neat. And of course, fuzzy dice, because, as I mentioned earlier, can't have a classic without fuzzy dice. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is... And that's definitely a clean engine bay, regardless. Oh, and another Nomad. This looks to be a panel wagon version. I'm like, but, uh, yeah, definitely a panel wagon version. Guy's probably a rod you know, drag racer. Oh, and of course, there's some really nice uh, zoomies coming out the bottom. Yeah. Near the back tires. Absolute beauty. Gorgeous cream color, too. Can't tell if the panel van's a custom thing or not, but what else? Oh, and of course, we have a nice hot rod. Ah, real beauty. Nice black. I don't remember much, but I talked with the owner. Real nice guy. You know, works at the VA, served in Nam. Real fun guy from what I could tell. I think he, I can't tell if he built it. I can't remember if he built it recently or not, but. Oh, there's a very lovely current gen chart, Allender. It's got that uh, really nice Hellcat logo on the rear quarter. Oh, and of course, there's a 1974 AMC AMX Javelin. Or was it AMC AMX Javelin? Either way, this thing still looks as stock as the day it rolled off the assembly line. So, yeah, credit where it's due for the owner managing that. And, of course, it's a, you know, a real nice car in its own right. And, of course, next to that, we have ourselves... Oh, wow, that was a nice interior. <clears throat> yeah. And, of course, next to that, we have what looks to be a Restomod Camaro. Or at least I'm assuming it's Restomod, judging by the modern wheels and brake pads. But, yeah. Def Actually, I'm pretty sure that's a Restomod. Real beauty. Ah, I can't tell what that shade of blue is, though, but I like it. What does that mean, Restomod? Oh, Resto Mod is basically a, where you restore a car with a number of modern components. You know, new brakes. Oh, and uh, here we have a, let's see, and here we have a Mustang Fastback. Most likely a, you know, a regular Mustang, but it could be a GT350. But uh, definitely a beauty either way. Got that nice bullet green, but you know, it's not exactly the bullet Mustang. Not the right wheels. And it's got the Shelby stripes on it. Real beauty. Oh, and uh, speaking of Shelby, it's got uh, you know, one or two stickers you know, regarding him. Carol Shelby. And when you say Bullet uh, Mustang, what do you mean? Oh, uh, the Mustang from the movie Bullet. You know, that certain green. Oh, there's a, you know, a tea bucket hot rod. T-Buckets are basically built from uh, Model T's. They're whole replicas now. And I'm pretty sure that's like a replica, considering they haven't made the Model T in like, what, 80, 90, maybe even 100 years? But it's always possible that might have been passed down through the family, but I'm willing to bet it's most likely a replica. Oh, and of course, here we have a 1957 Ford Thunderbird. Pretty much everything is stock. Not a single ounce of uh, you know, new stuff except for the interior, but even then, that's uh, you know that's a factory color, at least according to the owner. You know, I got to talk with him. He managed to do a good job with this one. Even the vintage radio and radio antenna works, which is pretty much awesome in itself. Because I don't think that is easy at all. And that's the end of that particular tour. I hope you enjoyed seeing cars old and new, and I hope I sparked an interest for you. Here's to hoping I'll see you at the next show.
Um, a lot of times girls and women on the spectrum hear this. Um, that's, you know, an, an area that I work in as well. And oftentimes, oh, you know, you can't have autism. You, you're a girl. Um, and again, that is just out of the diagnostic ratio of four to one with more boys than girls being diagnosed. Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Carrie Magra, professional speaker and author. I have autism and also have dysgraphia, and this is Stories from the Spectrum, and I am here with a very, very special guest. She's also a dear friend. Her name is Amy Graffino, and Amy, why don't you just tell us a, a little bit about yourself as we're kicking off today? Sure, Carrie. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Gravino, as Carrie said, and I am a relationship coach in the Rutgers Center for Adult Autism Services and an autism sexuality advocate and professional public speaker. What are some things, and maybe like if you could give me like four or five things that you shouldn't say to somebody who's on the autism spectrum based on your experiences? Sure. So, I mean, there's been so many things that have been said to me over the years that I wish people would not say. And things I hear people say to autistic individuals, whether it's their child or their student, that, you know, people oftentimes have their hearts in the right places, but their mouths are in the wrong places. Um, and a lot of it, I think, ties into the expectations that we have or don't have for people on the spectrum. So, um, you know, saying to someone, um, oh, you know, you're so smart. I would never know that you had autism until you said something. That's something that's been said to me, you know, and that that's not helpful because I mean, I'm harder on myself than anybody, of course, but um, it, you know, make, it makes me feel like I should be able to do things that either I can't necessarily do or that I need to learn how to do. And then I feel frustrated that I can't do those things. And then, and then I feel afraid I'm going to let everybody down. So, you know, also, uh, you, you, well, you're autistic. You have, you, you're not capable of empathy. And that's something that was written about me as, as a child. It was written by a mental health professional um, saying, you know, uh, Amy does not understand empathy uh, and, and, you know, has no sense of humor. And I was nine years old when these things were written about me. I was nine. I was a child. And this person decided this about me. Um, and, and I think that just speaks to a general theme of not making, you know, proclamations at all about autistic people because we tend to have this, you know, preconceived idea that when somebody's diagnosed, if they're, if they're a child, for example, that that's where they're always going to be. That autistic people can't grow and change, and that's not true. It's it's simply not true. So, you know, and and for many mental health professionals, they are informing parents' perceptions of their children. So you have to be very careful about saying these things, not just to an autistic child, but to to their parents, to you know anybody who is going to be shaped and informed by what you write. The 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 team at the school that works with the child, you know, the paraprofessionals and the speech pathologist and whoever else. We you have to just be so, so careful. And um, and again, I think that just speaks to an overarching theme. With I see this with lots of adults talking about autistic people when they're in the room as if they can't hear them. Or in the room. Yeah. Or, yeah, exactly. Well, and, the, 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 that, whole idea about, the whole idea about empathy, it's just I, some of the kids I work with and some of the adults who are close friends with me all on the spectrum are some of the most empathetic people I've ever met. So being able to be mindful of that, I think it's really, really important. So Amy, so obviously you have a wide range of expertise in the world of autism. For parents, educators, and just our, our general society, what would be some books, some films maybe, that you would recommend to people to learn a little bit more about autism? Sure. So, I mean, when I think about, you know, autism in, in any kind of media representation, I think, you know, with, with films and TV that there isn't any one movie or TV show that's really nailed it yet in terms of representing autism. Um, I mean, we are starting to see a shift, I think, a little bit in, in some depictions. We have, as, you know, Carrie can tell you, Love on the Spectrum is coming out, the U.S. version. It was originally in Australia. And what I like about that is that it is showing autistic people as they authentically are. You know, this is, I mean, we know that there is an element of scripting to some reality TV shows, but autistic people are, are genuine people, I think, by and large. And so we're, we're getting something that's very refreshing, and that is people representing themselves and being, you know, who they are, uh, barring any editing, you know, uh, you know, shenanigans. But, yeah, um, like the you know, in terms of <laughs> fictional, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but, you know, in terms of fictional depictions, I... I don't think I've yet seen one that like totally nails it. Um, there, there was uh, 
that show everything is going to be all right. I heard a lot of, right. Is that the one I heard a lot of good uh, things yeah. about that? Yeah. Yeah. Everything's going to be okay on the free form. Everything's going to be really, okay. That's yeah, it. I like that. Yeah. yeah. That, that got canceled. I heard. So yeah. I heard, I heard positive things about that. Um, but uh, you know, in the books, they're starting, there's a lot of books that are written by people on the spectrum, which is like a really great thing. I think, you know, there's so many books you can read about autism, but you get something really different and really raw and authentic when you read books that are written by autistic people. Um, again, Holiday Wiley's Pretending to be Normal is a seminal book. Uh, it's absolutely outstanding. Um, Temple Grandin, Thinking in Pictures was one of the first, I think, that came out written by, by folks on the spectrum. And it is, you know, again, take, she's a product of her time, Temple, and the world has changed, you know, since that came out, certainly. But sure. um, uh, and then, of course, Carrie, you put out books that, you know, I know have been really helpful to a lot of people. And I and, myself am, am, you know, currently yeah. authoring a book. Yeah, no, um, I'm called say, The you, Naughty Audi. Yeah, The Naughty Audi. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I am so excited to read that book where, whenever it, it, it does come out because it's, you know, we, we, I often talk about relationships, but what I think you've hit the nail on the head on, which a lot of, experts really just don't even want to talk about is sexuality. And I think you've kind yeah. of championed that cause within our autism community. Uh, so I'm really excited to hear what you think about that topic specifically. Um, some great recommendations. Temple Grand's The Game Pictures was kind of one of the first ones I also read when I was 19 and mm -hmm. trying to disclose to more people about my autism mm -hmm. diagnosis. So obviously we have the yeah. Temple Grandits of the world that we can follow. Who are some other autism advocates that you currently follow in the community who mm -hmm. either inspire, educate, just all of the above really? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of amazing uh, advocates out there, both who are on and off the spectrum. Uh, and of course, immediately one that comes to mind is my dear friend, Dr. Peter Gerhardt, who is an amazing man. Um, he, he is not autistic, but he has been working with autistic adults for over 30 years. And he, he is like the authority, as far as I'm concerned, on, on adults on the spectrum. And he's a passionate advocate. And he has, most importantly to me, the reason why I, I mentioned him is that he doesn't just work with autistic adults. He is friends with autistic adults. You know, he's not just seeing them as clients. Or, or patients or students, they're, they're friends, they're, you know, so he sees us as human beings. And I think that's just so important. It sounds like a basic thing, but it's not. <laughs> um, and he's one of my closest friends, consequently. Um, again, there's, oh gosh, there's just so many amazing people out there. Uh, Denny Bowman, who is also in Love in the Spectrum, she's great. I mean, she's has her own animation company and she, she's come so far in, in the years I've known her, like she's just grown up in front of me. She was a little baby and now she's all like I know. woman size. And everything. It feels so weird. Cause what? we gave her, we gave her a scholarship when she was going to Woodbury. And now I'm just like, now she's on a show talking about being in relationships and talking to boys. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. <laughs> How can people learn more about you and your journey? And what would you like people to know about you? Oh gosh. So I guess, you know, because when I, I give presentations mainly on autism and sexuality, that's kind of my dedicated special area of interest and in research, but I present on other topics as well, you know, growing up on the spectrum and drinking into adulthood with autism. And I always try to emphasize the fact that this is a journey and that as far as I've come, I am still learning. Um, I, I, I dislike the word expert very strongly for this reason, because to me, expert is a static word that confers with it an authority that cannot be challenged. So I like the word specialist more because we're learning so much all the time about sexuality. We're learning so much all the time about autism. So I don't think any one person is a true expert in that, in that authoritative you know, sense. Um, and, and so I, I don't have all the answers and I want people to know that no one person does have all the answers. Right. And so that the most powerful thing that I, that I can say to any client I work with or, or any or anything is I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but let's find out together. Right. That's what it's all about. It's about growing and learning together and, and, and all of us being on, on, on a journey in this way. Um, I love and that. And to help those. Yeah. To help those who are walking in the path I was once on. Yeah. Know? 
Well, it, 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 it's also very humbling when you, you can say like, I don't know all the answers and you don't pretend to know all the answers because I know many experts in the community who, who really think of themselves in that way and oh, yeah. you know, it's not doing justice for the community. And we we like to talk about autism and authenticity a lot. You know, let's just make sure that we're trying to do that. Hi everyone, it's Stephen Gaber, the Autistic Traveler. And today I'm gonna to give you a tour of downtown Orange to see the vintage like this is. Have a good time. Orange Historical District is a one square plaza and contains many of the historic buildings that were created in Orange's incorporation. Orange is a vibrant commercial district that contains the original bank and oldest operation soda fountain. This historic district was placed on the National Register of Historic Districts in 1997 and is the largest National Register Historical District in California. The city of Orange was incorporated in April 6, 1888 during the city reform area of urban planning. Orange dates back to 1869 when were lawyers Andrew Chapman and Alfred Glassell accepted the land from Rancho Santiago de Santa Ana as legal fees. In the summer of 1871, Captain William Glassell drove a survey and called it Richland. Following this event, the Old Town District was found in this plaza. This town was originally called Richland and was changed to Orange in 1873 when they applied for a post office in the town, but discovered there was a town called Richland in Northern California. Legend has it that this town was named after during a poker game, but it was really based on promotional value. Oranges and other semi-crops were found in this town, which is probably why it got the name Orange. And they also were considering splitting this part into a separate part of Orange County, into two counties. Let me tell you why I'm visiting the antique shop so much, because it was my favorite highlight of the day. And I love seeing Robin Williams as the genie. You should buy that. Best looking Starbucks I ever saw. Wow, that architecture. And this architecture makes downtown Orange look amazing. Welcome to downtown Orange. One could take the Metrolink all the way from downtown Union Station in Los Angeles to Santa Fe Depot in San Diego. Much better than driving on the 5 freeway and take spending gas money. Wow, those gas prices are expensive. Wow, look at these antique cars. They're very nice old looking cars. Thank you for checking out the Orange Circle with me. I hope you had a good time. Oh, look, a mariachi band trying to make money. Shops. Wow, this was better than I thought.